how do you want to be known? How do you want to be remembered? And if we go back again to what that personal brand is, it's okay to be what you want to be. If you're somebody who goes on social media, it's really important for you to stay in that business zone and make sure that the comments you're making, that the reputation that you're building also match what you do in business. So that when people see a post, they get it, they understand this is what you're about, this is what you're an expert in, this is what you're speaking about. So the question really becomes, what are you doing to plant the seeds for what your personal brand actually is? In other words, just being brand new in the marketplace is not enough. You've got to sit down and figure out what these things are that you need to say about you in ways that you need to say them so that people have no choice but to listen and be curious about what it is you do and why you do it. Once you've figured out exactly what you want your brand to be about, stay there, stay in your space. Welcome back, everyone. We're here once again today with Jill Collins Connections. I have a dear friend of mine that I want to share with you today. His name is Glenn Rudin. Glenn is known as the Message Master. <laughs> I love this title. Message Master. What does that mean? Basically, what he does is he helps people craft and deliver a message about what they do. He does it with such clarity and which, such precision that it's what people often call your elevator pitch. But he does it in this way that's so special because he helps you see the value in what you have to offer. And really, he pulls that out of you and helps you deliver that one sentence or those couple sentences that you need to have in your pocket to be able to share with the world or share with someone when you're walking around and you're talking to people about what you do. So what do you always say when someone says, hey, what do you do? And you go, oh, well, I'm kind of a... He helps you with that. Okay, so let's get started. I want to introduce Glenn. Glenn, welcome. So happy to have you here today. And I am so happy to be here. You know, Jill, I'm a huge fan. I've been following. Uh, you on social media for the longest time, what seems like the longest time based on our lives on Clubhouse going back a few years ago. So yes. the fact that we built this bond and I get the opportunity now to actually be on your podcast is a big thrill for me. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. You know, I was, we talked a, a week or two ago and I said, gosh, Glenn, I got to have you on the show because, you know, I think so many people today, we're, everybody I know seems like they're, wanting to build a personal brand. And it's and, I, and the question I would have is, should everyone have a personal brand? Well, or maybe let's start with what is a personal brand? You know what? Let's, let's go real, real down to basics. What's, what is okay. a personal brand? So a, a, a personal brand is similar to a business brand, but let's just stay on personal brand for the moment. And the easiest way to describe this is when you're no longer, when you've already met somebody, but now you're no longer in their presence. And somebody would say, hey, you know, what do you know about Jill Collins? What impression do you have of her? When Jill's no longer around, I've met her, I've spoken to her, I've been at a networking event with her, I've been on a Zoom call, or I've been in Clubhouse with her. And now somebody in a completely separate conversation, somewhere away from that says, hey, I heard about this person, Jill Collins. What do you think of her? What, what about her? And the, the impressions that you've left me with are the essence of your personal brand. And of course, we all want those to be really positive attributes, professional, well put together, well spoken, enthusiastic, outgoing, friendly. You know, all these different kinds of uh, positive adjectives are really the ones that we want people uh, to be left with again when we're no longer around. And so the question really becomes, what, what are you or any of the people who are, who are able to see this or hear my voice or hear us talking about this today, what are you doing to plant the seeds for what your personal brand actually is? Are you being intentional about it or do you show up one day and you want to be the class clown? So now the people who hear you there think, oh, gee. The guy has a great sense of humor. This woman has a great sense of humor. That's really what they're all about. Or are you really serious? Are you really well studied on your topic? So that when somebody thinks of you, they think, wow, they're re really immersed in that topic. And so if something comes up and I want to know about that, or somebody needs to know about that, that's the person I'm going to introduce them to. So hopefully that's a good primer 
on what the personal brand is. And then we can get into all different ways of you defining what you want yours to be. And let me, I know it's a long answer. Let me just go one step further. If you are a solopreneur and you are the business, it is essential that you have a personal brand which ties in to your business brand so that you don't create dissonance. When we see one, it seems disconnected from the other. And I'll, I'll throw it back to you. On Ooh, I love that. You know, there's two things. Wow. I just, I got half a page of notes already. Um, and I hope everyone, I always tell everyone in the beginning and I forgot, get your notebook and pen and paper, whatever you got, because you need to rewind this if you didn't catch this, because this is, we're going to go deep here. I love this already. Um, first thing you got, I never heard this before, is the personal brand is what people say about you when you're not around. Wow. Okay. That is like a whole different thing than what I was ever thinking about personal brand. You and I've talked a few times on the phone before this interview, and I never heard this. This is great. I'm like, that is a huge one. The next one I got here was you said that something around the lines of um, how are you showing up? And what I wrote down is, are you a flip flopper? Do you not know? Are you not having clarity in what it is that we do? Like one day we show up this way, or then we also do this other thing. And, we, and, we, and we're giving mixed messages to people. And so they don't really know how to explain what we do. And then many of us are today are in a lot of different areas. Like I'm a podcaster, also an investor, and I used to be a coach. I don't do a lot of coaching anymore, but do I say I'm a coach? So people go, I thought she was a coach. Wait, I thought she was doing this other thing. And I'm so always overly concerned and, and, and um, almost obsessed with not being confusing to people. That's my, my almost fear I have. So that's interesting. I want to dive on that and on that. The, the last one, though, you said was to show up consistently in all areas. And I wrote the words down, integrity and authenticity. So it's kind of like a personal brand is when I'm, when I'm out with a certain group of friends, am I showing up the same way? Maybe I'm off. If I am, please correct me. But if I'm showing up a certain way in a certain way with friends and then in another space where I'm in, do I show up differently? And then if those worlds collide, is there a, is there a um, like, does, is there a mismatch? Is there, is there like, whoa, I didn't know she was like that. What happened here? She's usually like this and she's doing this. Is that kind of a, important in, with personal brand or am I off it's a, there? It's a, that's a really, really great question. And, and I think we, we, we all have to give ourselves some time out when, listen, you know, if, if I'm doing what, what I'm doing as a message guy, as a branding guy, but you know, then I go and, you know, I go to a bar and I'm watching a football game with a bunch of people. Do I really want to be there doing a dissertation on how poorly, you know, the branding on the uniforms looks or the advertisers that are coming on their branding doesn't really match what's going on with the sport. And people start thinking, hey, can we just watch the game? So I think we have to be careful about separating, you know, personal from where that is. But right, the the, the way things are today, right? Let's say we've got three different buckets. We've got our really, really professional space. That's when we're doing what we do for a living. And that's, again, where you want what, what you do, what you stand for to show up with your brand and really to be in sync. You know, then you've got this, this middle ground where you're being a person and you're reacting uh, with other people. And these are more business type friends, business type connections. And I think here too, you want to be careful about not going too off brand because these people have my, have migrated, I'm doing it the wrong way, have migrated from over here on the business side. And now they're business kinds of friends. And then we'll go all the way over here on this side. And we'll say, these are people who really know you, uh, who you can, not me, but other people like you could let their hair down in front of these people and really be comfortable and at ease and not have to be quote unquote on. So I think in that situation, it's okay to be what you want to be. And, and here's a really interesting and important thing to think about when we're, we're having these discussions. If you're somebody who goes on social media, if you use Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn to support your business, it's really important for you to stay in that business zone and make sure that the comments you're making, that the reputation that you're building also match what you do in business so that when people see a post, they get it, they understand this is what you're about, this is what you're an expert in, this is what you're speaking about. 
Now, if you want to go all the way out here into you want to make zany comments, political comments, offhanded comments, if you want to do that, in my judgment, you really need to pick a different account. You really need to have a different name, something that's completely removed from what you're doing on the business side, because on that personal side, you can imagine, let's say you talk politics, you can immediately offend half of your audience. If -hmm. you start talking about world politics, you can immediately offend a lot of people. And some would say, well, then you're not really being your real authentic you. And for me, if I'm really giving people practical business advice, it's this. If you're in business to do business, that's what you do. And that's really where that all, come to me, stays pure. And if you really want to be in, in the business of being funny, being a jokester, being a political commentator, I think you need to really figure out ways of separating the two, because very often they could be conflicting and then you're sending up mixed signals to people. So hopefully that makes sense. I think that was um, worth the cost of admission here today. That was a great one. That is so brilliant. Because we're all dealing with that. A lot of us who are in business and we have our social media accounts and, you know, we, we, I actually have two and I played around with the personal business and Facebook and then the Instagram, I did a business one and, and I just had so many more personal followers with my, my personal accounts. And so it's, it's, do I separate them? And I just, I just decided to kind of go with the business one or the personal one. And I love that because I think we're all kind of skating on that edge. It's like, when do you post like, Hey, I was out with friends or, you know, commenting, you know, with, with your, t- with your profile, you know, your, uh, what's the word for it? Your, um, your, ch- your handle, you know, your name, profile name. And then, you know, it's like, oh, that, that's kind of being, a, you know, not really, it's gonna, that's gonna be controversial. That's gonna be too controversial. They always say controversy is a little bit is okay. A little bit of it's okay in marketing and business, but I think sometimes you tend to, you know, we can go too far. And I, that's wow. Right. And, and to me, this represent this represents to me, this term called brand erosion. So if, if I'm really speaking on that business front and I really want to be considered an expert there and people, I start to develop a following, people start to understand, oh, this is what this person does. This is what they speak about. I have trust, right? We always, we always heard on, uh, on the clubhouse app that you and I met on know, like, and trust. So I'm getting to know this person. I'm getting to like them. I'm getting to trust them, that they're consistent, that the messages are are always there. Maybe they're a little bit, you know, they, they, they stray out of their lane a little bit, but overall, they're right there. Now, if I start being this comedian, if I start being this political commentator, if I start being this roasting person, now I start to erode my personal brand credibility. Now people start saying, wait a minute, this was the guy who, who was doing all this stuff on branding and messaging. And now he's over here talking politics or he's over here talking movie critiques or, or something else. And it's like, who is this? Who is this? In other words, like, you know, we always used to say, what, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm-hmm. And to me, that's, a, that's the question. What do you want to be when you grow up with your business? How do you want to be known? And if we go back again to what that personal brand is, how do you want to be remembered? If that last comment was something controversial or something flip about something that is a controversial topic, is that the last thing that people are now remembering as opposed to, wow, I know this person can really help me with my elevator pitch? Or is it, hmm, this guy's talking about you know uh, his favorite lines from the Barbie movie, but what, 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 what's going on there? You know, Does he think he's a movie critic or is he a branding guy? And now all of a sudden... There's this wishy-washy as opposed to this straight and narrow, people really getting where I am. And, and I think part of this, a big part of this, comes from the idea that, number one, we're afraid somehow if we keep consistent and doing the same thing, it's going to be boring to people. People are going to be bored by that consistent message. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, I heard that before, heard that before. And, and I think one of the things that, that we all have to be really careful about is that we're hearing our message over and over again, but there's a really, really good shot, I'm going to say almost all the time, that most of the people who are hearing your message or seeing it are probably seeing it for the first, second, maybe third time. They're not bored with it. They're just getting the idea of this is what you do. 
So people start getting bored and then they start thinking, oh, I've got to go off topic to get likes. I've got to go off topic so people feel like I'm fun and they they really want to be around me and things like that. And listen, I would caution against that. I would say if you're really serious and you really want to be intentional about your brand, stay on it and stay consistently on it. Uh, to me, that's the best advice that I could give you once you've figured out exactly what you want your brand to be about. Stay there. Stay in your space. Okay. Stay in your space. Stay in your lane and your in your in your um in your space. I I love that. Is it? People are afraid it'll get boring. And really, I think you've mentioned that it takes. How many times does it take today? Um, to for someone to actually notice, or do you have to hit reach someone with a message for them before they'll even notice it today? With all of the things we're bombarded with. You know, it it used to be with with commercial television. It used to be seven. And I've heard more recently, in other words, like you'd have to see a commercial for the Burger King, whatever, you know, the the double Whopper with cheese that's on promotion right now that you had to see that seven times across all of your watching over a couple of weeks before it would really sink in. And you'd be like, well, I got to get one of those burgers. I think today, because the attention spans are so splintered, I've heard that the number is really more like 12. And so you have to keep that in mind also as you're doing the things you're doing, right? Say, you know, you've sent out three emails now about something and people are not responding. You're barely, barely scratching the surface of, you know, them even contemplating who you are or what your brand is. And again, that's why it's so important to stay consistent with this, because let's just say the number is 12, Jill. And now we've spent this time sending out eight or 10 messages and we're not getting the response we want. Oh, gee, I think I'm going to go out with the next one and I'm going to try to be a comedian and try to be funny. And it's not received that way or it's confusing. Well, now this person who's maybe seen you five or six times and now they see that and they're like, wait a minute, wasn't that the guy who I keep seeing these? I'm like taking notes on what he's saying about messaging or branding. And now he's out here doing some kind of joke about Mother's Day or something. And it's like, Where'd that come from? You know, who is that guy now? And so you're, you're again, you're creating uh, erosion mm -hmm. and you're creating some dissonance for people also because they're not really sure who you are authentically in terms of what you're doing. Wow. Yeah. The brand erosion and dissonance. And, and what I got was um, give it time. You know, and you really hit me, it hit me hard because um, sometimes when we don't see the numbers, if we're trying to grow or we're not getting sales or, you know, it takes more time today. You're right, is, is the, the compared to the past when we watched commercials and we saw a billboard and went, oh, there's a Burger King or there's that. And then, you know, you're like, oh, I think I'm hungry. And I wonder why. Well, I saw it on TV and then I saw a newspaper ad, you know, or something, right? Um, right. We've got so many things. And then um, I, what also occurred to me is, and this is my personal thing that I get is I don't want to bother people. So like if, when you said the three emails and, and then we think, oh, it didn't work, and that's me. <laughs> I did send two or three emails, those of you who have watched and are on my list. And I went, oh, I don't want to bother people too much. But the people that I sent the notes to, they said, oh my gosh, I didn't know you were of a podcast. I'm like, how could they not have known? I thought everybody knew. No, they don't know. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Right, right. We have the, this tendency to think that the, the world is watching and listening to every last thing that we do. And th the truth is really that those three emails may never have been seen for whatever <laughs> reason. They might have been spam filtered for whatever reason. Uh, you know, the, the day that those went out, there was a deluge of other emails that this person got and they got lost. I mean, you know, that's happened to me even recently where someone said, didn't you get my email responding to this? And I wrote back and I said, no, I, I never saw that. And, you know, then they, they wrote back and I said, okay, you know, now, you know, now I understand, now I get it. I won't bother you anymore because now I understand, you know, that you did reply um, to me about this. Yeah. But we just all have this tendency to, you know, to think that, that, um, you know, that, that it's all about us, right. Uh, from the, from the four agreements, right. Taking things personally, which we never should do. And right. That agreement is it's, it's not about you it's about them you know we have no idea what's going on in someone's in someone's day i think mm -hmm. that, that that the challenge for us really is to say okay i i, I had a bunch of uh, email campaigns go out at 10 in the morning maybe my audience isn't looking at 10 in the morning maybe i need to duplicate that at 2 
or 4 p.m. And maybe that's when, you know, when they're listening to me as opposed to uh, I wasn't any good. The message wasn't any good. Right. And then we get into that whole um, imposter syndrome deal where we think that what we're doing isn't any good. And again, the, the truth is that th- th- there's so much information being bombarded on everybody all day long that you're on your emails, your social medias, whatever. How often do you even see the things that you really want to see or the people who you're following? How often do I see Joe Collins' um, Instagram messages? I feel like I see them more now because I've replied to some and liked some and maybe the, you know, the algorithm yeah. is feeding them to me some more. But if you were sending these things out and you're saying, gee, you know, I, I, th- there's never a time that, that Glenn is responding, that there's no likes on here, there's no comments on here, and it could very well be I've never seen them. So as opposed to you taking it personally and thinking, gee, I guess what I'm saying isn't any good or he would respond, it's really more how much stuff is he getting piled, buried under that he can't really take the time to see my stuff. And, wow. and so- You know, just a quick piece of advice. If you do have people that you're looking to make an impression on, instead of just hitting send, go back and send that stuff directly to some of the people that you want to see it. Now, I don't know if you get those. I get those sometimes and I try to understand why did this person send this to me? They they either wanted my buy-in on it or they wanted to be involved in, in whatever their offer was. But if they just left it to chance and put it out there, there's a good chance that I wouldn't actually see it. Right, right. There's a good chance you wouldn't see it. And that happens to me all the time. I know it's so true. And I think I, there's, there's some emails that I, I automatically just go through. And email is probably the worst way to reach me I, because I get hundreds a day. But, um, I, you know, some people really like email and still so. So it's, you know, it's just uh, it's not taking it personally. I love that. Um, but hey, for all you Jill Collins fans, there's a huge clue. Stop sending her email. Find another <laughs> way him. into her heart. Find another yeah. way into her brain. But it's not going to be email because that's going to be the least effective. And yeah. she's told you that, right? That's one of the, the keys to good networking. How would you like me to follow up with you? How would you like me to be in contact with you? Instead of just assuming, I'll throw you on my email list. And I know you're just going to respond to everything that I put out there. Okay. There you go. So be be mindful. Be asking those quite right questions when you're talking and networking with people. That's a good tip. So I'm thinking about, we talked about what the definition of personal brand is, and we went really into the long, but I, but that was a whole different definition than I ever expected. So I have like two pages of notes here already. And um, so but other, other people got something from that as well. And I wanted to um, kind of go into is, is then at that point is we did talk a little bit about who should have a personal brand. Should everyone have one? And, um, how does how do they um, let's go into elevator your the the mastering the message because I think um, for someone let's assume someone has a personal brand or wants to have one um, how do they what's the first thing they should focus on when they start doing something with their with that what what how do you it's the biggest mistake yeah like what is it, it it's a great about? great question and the the very the, the simplest answer is a, a really short word why okay why. Do you do what you do? Most people, again, they, they end up doing whatever they're doing, either by chance, maybe some people wanted to do it. But if you can't explain why, why you're passionate about it, why it meant something to you, why this is something that you want to be known for, why this is something that you want to help the world with, uh, I, I think in my book, um, th- there's right. a line about... Um, you know, why you do this, you should feel so passionate about it. Um, it should almost make you cry. And, and that's the truth. Because if, if, if you can't answer that why question for starters, then it's really hard to even come up with anything resembling an elevator pitch. Because if you don't know why you're doing it, there's a really good chance either we're not going to care or we're not going to understand what is in it for us. And that's really, at the end of the day, the, the, the best elevator pitches are really all about what is in it for the audience. When they hear something about it and they start to understand why you do what you do, then they can either say, well, listen, that, that sounds meaningful to me, or I don't really care about that, but I know a half a dozen people that really do. And I'm glad I now understand that because I can take this person's contact information down. And I can find people that I can funnel to them and say, 
you know, I'm not really interested in, you know, learning how to run um, a 26 mile marathon, but I know you're a real runner. This is probably something that you want to do. So, you know, the person who's why is I do the because many people want to be runners. So many people strive to do this instrumental run in their lives and they don't know, you know, how to go about doing it. That would be the beginnings of why I'm a, a running coach that specializes in teaching people how to run a marathon. I don't know what got me off in, uh, in that, the New York marathon is I think coming up. So maybe that got me in the, in the direction of thinking about that. And so what I say to people is why do you do what you do and why does it matter to us? So the, the challenge that I really have for people who listen to me is, have you ever, however you do this for yourself, gone through this exercise, have you ever literally sat down with a piece of paper and tried to write out why you do what you do? Have you ever sat at a Google document or a Word document? What, however you do your recording of your thoughts and figured out why you do what you do. Because when you can do that, then you can start to really wordsmith it and describe it in ways that somebody potentially would find compelling enough to say, I heard something there that was interesting, why this person does what they do, and I'd like to know more. Or I know somebody that would like to know more, and now I want to get them in touch with this person. So, so go back to whatever it is you do and start with why do you do it in the first place? Okay. So with the ultimate goal, you said, and then uh, wordsmith it, and also to why does it matter to, to, to someone else? Sure. Right. And, and then we, you know, we go step yep. further. I have this whole exercise that, uh, that I go through um, with people, which is called f fleshing out your purpose and your position for your pitch. And it starts with that why. And then it gets into, you know, how are you different in Ooh. the way that you deliver? what you do versus other people that do it. And here's a really important thing for people to keep in mind also. Regardless of what business you're in and how unique you think it is, there's most likely somebody out there in your market, in your neighborhood, on your frequencies, in your social media that's been doing it longer, that does it better, that has more customers that already has established a beachhead and a brand and a business there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and if they've already got loyal customers and you come along and you want to be in that same business, you've got to come up with reasons for why those people would switch from whoever is supplying that service currently and making you the new supplier. So great example, if, if I'm in, um, in accounting and Jill Collins is my client and I've been working with her for a number of years and I know where all of Jill's skeletons financially are buried in the closet. I know her social security number. I know all her, where all her finances are, all this other stuff. In other words, Jill really trusts me as her financial person. And it's been a trust that's been built over time. And so now at a new networking event, a new finance person comes along and sees Jill and says, gee, I'd, I'd like to be Jill's financial planner, um, uh, accounting representative, whatever in that space. And Jill's already comfortable with this other person she has. She's got a relationship there with them. So why do you do what you do? And how is it different than the person that's already supplying that information, that service to Jill. I, I call this, we, we all have this. I call this our, um, our, uh, a shelf of, um, of services that we all have in our minds. Um, and the financial one is a perfect example because we all, I've, I've got a business. I've got somebody who does my accounting. So if you want to be my accountant, what are you going to do for me? Do you, do you do a free mid-year audit? Uh, do you go back and look at my books from last year and try to find places that I shouldn't have spent money uh, that I did? And, and this year you want to help me manage that? Or do you just want to do what somebody does for me now? Because if that's the case, I don't need you. Got somebody that does it. And so I call this this theoretical shelf that exists in all of our minds. Because if I said, Jill, 
Do you have an attorney if you get into some kind of legal issue? Of course you do. And if I said, do you have a personal trainer if, if you needed to get, you know, um, in shape? Do you have a favorite restaurant that you go to? Do you have a favorite coffee shop that you go to? And, and so on down the line, all these different things. Do you have a favorite dry cleaner uh, that, that you use if you use a dry cleaner? Do you have a f- favorite place to service your car? All of those service industries are all things in Jill's mind you've already got established. This is who does that for me. And then you go to a networking event or you're introduced to somebody who is a competitor to one of those services. And now they're going to say, I want you to move to me. Well, why are you going to move to them? What reason? Why do they do? What do they do different? How do they differentiate themselves? And here's just a quick example of this. Uh, this, this actually happened live in a clubhouse room. Um, a, a young woman came on, uh, on stage, all excited. She was in the Midwest of the, of the United States. She was opening up a new uh, coffee shop. Um, a brand new coffee shop. And she was all excited about that. How, you know, how am I going to, um, you know, I'm really excited about this. And I spent all this money. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, have you taken the time to even draw like a five mile circle, a three mile circle around where your coffee shop is to figure out how many other coffee shops there already are? No, I haven't. Well, don't you think that all the people who are getting coffee are already in the habit of going down Main Street, making a left on Third Avenue. That's their favorite place. They know their mocha latte, bente, whenever they get there, whether it's a Starbucks or someplace else, they're in that habit. They know exactly where they're going. They probably don't even have to be awake to get in the car and drive to that spot because it's their habit. You're now asking them to change a habit. They know the place. They know the drinks. They know the service. They know exactly what they're getting. They know how to get there. They know where they're parking. And what you're saying is just because you're a nice young woman and you're opening up this coffee shop, everyone's going to switch their allegiance from where they are now to you. And she's like, wow, I never really thought about it like that. And I said, I wish you would have been here six months ago because maybe we would have, we would have done a number of different things to start getting people to think about trying your coffee shop before you opened on day one. And you're standing in the front door uh, of the shop and you're looking left and right and say, where is everybody? I opened up my coffee shop now. So uh, it's important to understand that we're trying to get people to change habits. And just one more uh, asterisk on this point, because people will say this too. I've got this great brand new idea that no one ever thought of before. Let's say you want to even compare this to like a Tesla car, right? Because they've gotten so popular. And what I say is, look, it's it's now October 24, 2023. So basically, the world has been living without your thing for the last 2,023 years. Do you think we can live without it for another couple of years, right? Unless you give us an amazing reason why we've got to now start doing this. Buy this new food. Go to this new restaurant. Deal with whatever your great new invention is that's going to change the world. Because right now, I'm doing just fine, just the way I am without your amazing invention that I'm going to have to spend whatever amount of money I'm going to have to spend on it. So in other words, just being brand new in the marketplace is not enough. You still have to have a compelling reason why somebody would change a habit from where they are now or start a new one with your brand new product. Wow. I, 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 I'm just loving this so much because I'm this is an exercise that I realize isn't just to get the message clear, because I had a question for you that I was going to ask. It's because I've worked with a couple of people that are, say, they're experts at help, helping people craft their, their elevator pitch, right? And I've had a couple, right? And I, and, and I spent a lot of time with it, and I didn't do the exercise. But for me, when I had to use it, I kind of was like, one, I had to like memorize it, and then I had to kind of go, oh, it just doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel authentic. I feel like I'm sa- I'm, it's kind of salesy. And because there's a formula, you know, the what do they need, you know, the whole thing and that people have had. And I went, I still does this feel salesy. It doesn't feel authentic to me. So here's what I just realized with what you said in here is you said you have to come up with um, ideas of um, why you have um, what someone else, other professionals, people that are more seasoned than you. And I think if you don't go through this exercise and you just merely try to craft what it is you do, you're actually selling yourself on who you are. Because I think if you don't go through this exercise, you're going to feel like an imposter. 
it's you have to sell yourself first. It's if people always say you have to believe in your brain, you have to be willing to buy your own product. Would you buy your own product? And a lot of people say, yeah, I would. But why? And you have to be able to tell it and you have to be able to tell yourself inside, deep inside to know that, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I have to go through this exercise and say, what is it really that I'm doing? And what is it that, why, what, why am I better than the next guy? Because I've stopped myself from doing and starting so many things because I can always find someone who's doing it better than me or who's been in it longer or who I think is more, has more expertise or more knowledge or whatever it is. And I go, oh yeah, but and so I didn't, I was too, I was, just, I'm going to say to myself, I don't know if it was the word is lazy, but I was too lazy to go in and say, yeah, but why am I better than them at that? What is it that I can do that they're not doing? Or what, what can I, that I'm not doing now that I could do to add extra value that, that someone would want to actually change their habit and, and change their routine and go with me instead? And, and I so think that's inside that's job. You have to sell yourself, right? That's the answer right there. Why would they do it with you as opposed to who they're doing it with now? And it's not, it's not just enough because I'm Jill or because I'm Glenn and now someone's going to change that habit, right? And, and a lot of this comes across, like I, I love the, the fact that you said it didn't feel authentic. And that's why when, when I say you've really got to get into why you do it. So I'll, ju I'll just read this, Ryan. I happen to find it. Yeah. I had this marked in my book. You know, you need And to I want to mention your book. Yeah. What is your name of your book again? Yep. A brand, Very good. A brand in your hand. A brand in your hand. Yeah. Excellent. So this is a, a, a the, the business world's first rhyming and full color book on branding and messaging. If you like Dr. Seuss type rhymes, the whole book is oh, we'll written, the link. Is written that way. Uh, it's on okay. Amazon and we'll, we'll, okay, yeah, we'll I can give you the there. link. So the, the rhyme here about your, your mission statement and why you do what you do goes like this. You need to feel strongly that this is your why. You feel it so deeply, it could make you cry. This is passion you want them, the customers, to feel, to pursue your brand because it's for real. And let me just expand on this just for a second. If you, if you, can't get super passionate about what you're doing so that hearing you speak about it is incredibly compelling, then again, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Because if you can't get excited about it, for sure, we can't get excited about it. And this goes back to that comment from a few minutes ago about getting bored with your own content. Oh, I've done my elevator pitch now 50 times. I think I'll change it up. Nope. That's when you finally start to understand how to do it, how to deliver it, how to be compelling. And I'll go this step further for everyone as well, which is another mistake people make about elevator pitches. And some might think, well, this sounds phony. Your elevator pitch is in essence your performance. And so if you think about it like this, that if you were actually going on stage to do, to perform in a show. Of course, you'd, had, you'd have lines as your character in the show. Of course, you'd be in costume dressed as your character in the show. Of course, there's an audience out there that's listening to what you're about to do. And if you were in a show like that, you wouldn't dare show up without your costume, without your lines. And if no one was there, you certainly wouldn't show up to perform your, your um, play in front of nobody. And so what I say to people is you pretend that for that 30 seconds, it's just 30 seconds. You need to know your lines, your script. You need to be in costume, dressed as whatever your brand and your character should be so that when people see you, they take you seriously for what you do. And you have to belt it out to the audience, whether it's one person or 50 in a room. Stand up. Don't be embarrassed. This is your moment in the spotlight. You need to shine. And again, this is another place where people um, fall completely flat on their faces. They don't stand up. They don't know that pitch. The first thing they say is an um or an ah. Um, I've got some other tips that I can throw in there also. But people need to feel that passion. They do need to feel from you, wow, again, how could this guy get so worked up about branding or elevator pitch? Whatever your topic is. But they need to feel that from you. Because if they don't, then there's really no reason for them to follow up with you and say, ah, another guy talking about pitch, another guy talking about branding or whatever your topic is. And so, again, this is all about basic blocking and tackling. 
You've got to sit down and figure out what these things are that you need to say about you in ways that you need to say them so that people have no choice but to listen and and really be curious about what it is you do and why you do it. I think that is so good. So it's really just having the confidence, but it's, it's if you, I love that what you said is if you can't get excited about what you're doing, no one else will. And it's more than just believing in what your product is. It's getting excited about it. That's a clear distinction, right? It's people can say, oh, I believe in my product. I take it every day. It's the best thing I've ever had. It makes me feel better. But are you excited about it? Are you just Do we really to, feel that? In other words, right? Do- it's really great. It's pretty cool. I love this. It's, it's the best pen, pen on the planet. You know, it's really good. It's like, wow, good for you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Which, by the way, I, we do matching pencils. We love these pencils. We already yeah. I always, always like, yeah, there we go. Where's mine here? Somewhere along the, along yeah. the lines of, oh, here it is. There we go. There you go. Matching pencils. Field twist um, so, and let me, let me just say this also, because this is maybe we'll give people an example of this also. Um, you know, the, the, the Rolling Stones, I happen to be a big classic rock fan. And the Rolling Stones are still out there touring 45 years later. And, uh, you know, they just actually did, did a new album that, that's coming out, their first new work in a long time, but this is not an ad for them. They don't sponsor me, so enough about them. My point about it is that when Mick Jagger goes out and they go to South America or they go to Australia or they go to Binghamton, New York, to them, every single time they're doing one of their shows, the assumption is no one's ever heard us do Brown Sugar live. And we know that's going to be in our set list. And when it's time to do it, we are going to do it and be excited about it. Even though we've performed it 10,000 times, we're going to make sure that the 10,000 and first rendition of it sounds just as good to that audience because those people paid a lot of money to sit here and listen to it. And we owe them that. Well, listen, if you think of yourself as an act like that, and the people who got up early in the morning to belong to your networking group, or took time out of whatever they were doing, and they're now going to sit there and they're going to listen to you, then make it worth their while. Don't be bored. Be excited about it. And don't think, gee, this is really boring. It might be boring to you because you're now comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. But belt it out to us as if we're all hearing it for the first time, because chances are, we are. (laughs) That's so true. It's the truth. It's so funny. Again, going back to that fishbowl we think we live in, everybody knows everything about us and they really don't. They really don't. I want to I want to cover real quick too. Tell us about the offer that you have. I know you mentioned to me that you were going to offer a special with you, one of your programs that you have is the four-step introduction to brand messaging. What is that? And um, I think you said it's normally $1,200, but you're going to offer it to my viewers for $9.99. And yeah, the and, four-step and, and, introduction to brand messaging. This is, this is actually a, a great course and, uh, it, it's really getting to work with, um, with me in a, in a one on one setting where we're going to be filming you. Most likely it's going to be on Zoom because you've got followers and people who listen to your show from around the world. But we will take the time here on Zoom to get you down on film as you are right now in terms of the way you present yourself, present your brand do your elevator pitch. And then we're going to go ahead and just start from scratch. We're going to go through the exercises that we spoke about earlier, this fleshing out your purpose and position, this figuring out your why, this figuring out what is unique about your business. And we're then going to start with reworking your elevator pitch and filming you doing it. So we've got you actually doing it. So that's something that you'll actually be able to use for either your sizzle reel or your marketing or your website, right? We're going to make sure that that's a a very professional cleaned up piece. But then we're going to venture into your brand storytelling. And we're going to figure out precisely what type of brand storytelling applies to your particular business. Are you history-based? Are you customer-based? Are you integrity-based? Right? There's There's 14 different types of brand storytelling. So we're going to go back into your brand. We're going to figure out what some of the stories you need to tell about your business are, the success stories, um, the wins that you've had, the clients that you've had the most impact on. And we're going to turn those stories into video that you can use as well. 
so that by the time we go through all four of these classes, we are now going to be comfortable with you doing multiple elevator pitches because we know one size elevator pitch doesn't fit for everybody. We're going to pull success stories out of you. We're going to write them and we're going to have you um, learn how to present them in ways that are really compelling because once you do that elevator pitch and somebody wants to hear a little more information about what it is you do, we're going to want to hear some stories about why it works for the people that it works for and why we think based on the success we had with them, we think it's going to work for you. So there's a real art to being able uh, to do that. We're going to take a look at your website. We're going to take a look at your branding. We're going to take a look at your overall messaging. What are you doing on your social media? So these sessions with me generally go um, about 75 minutes. You know, it's, it's not really a straight hour. So you've really got to be prepared and set out the time uh, to do this kind of blocking and tackling and really be prepared to go deep on who you are and what you do and why you do it, because I'm really going to bore in with you. And we're going to spend some time also talking about exactly who your customers are. Are you B2B? Are you B2C? And is the way you're putting together your messaging appealing to those people? And have you taken the time to think about who all those different customers might be? Because one of the things that I find really incredible is how often people don't even understand who their customer base is. Because at the end of the day, if there isn't a customer base for what you're doing, the greatest message, the greatest storytelling in the world doesn't need to exist because there's not somebody out there who wants it or needs it. That's not normally the case, but that's a lot of what we will do as well. So by the time we're done with these four sessions, you will have a much better idea of what it is you're doing for yourself. It'll bring this clarity to you. And it will force you to really sit down and do homework to come back and really be prepared to be on camera, to be speaking in ways that are professional, uh, where your, your branding, your messaging appear exactly as I believe they should to give you the very best chance to create engagement, because that's what all of this is about, right? Eventually, it will lead to a sale. But before it ever gets to the point where somebody's pulling out their wallet or they're transferring money to you, we need to get them engaged and feeling like this is something that they really want to be involved in. So that's where those four classes will take um, anybody that uh, that that um, is is uh, quick enough to jump on that offer who hears this and says, "Glenn, I'm coming to you with the with the Jill Collins offer. I'd like to jump in on that. How quickly can we get that started?" Be thrilled to see any of the people who uh, who follow you, who are your audience, uh, come in and take advantage of that. Thank you, Glenn. I tell you what, that, that now we'll put all the information in the in the description below. But that is an incredible offer to work with somebody one on one for that price for less than a thousand dollars. I mean, <laughs> um, that's a really. I'm I'm not just saying that. I'm I'm you know you, those that know me, I'm har I'm horrible at selling, and I'm just saying this honestly from the bottom of my heart. This is really a good deal. Um, with what you just described that you offer, I can think of so many people right now that I know that would be like, yeah, that's really the, the crux of what I'm needing is just getting clarity and then just having a finished product that I feel comfortable. Like you're going to give them a deliverable, give deliverables with videos that they can use and just to have have a sense of certainty and, and clarity that I'm on, I'm on point with my web, website. I'm on point with my social media and my message is all aligning. It's all connecting. That's great. Thank you for that. That's a beautiful offer. Thank you. Yeah. And and listen, I, I love doing that work because when, when I get to somebody's website and I see what most people are doing, it's for me, it's really obvious to look at that and say, there's no way in the world where we're getting this, getting this, and putting them together and getting what you want us to get out of it. And so, yes, do, do I get paid to do this? I do. And obviously, I appreciate that because I know money is near and dear to everybody. But mm -hmm. the feeling of satisfaction, helping somebody overcome all that, uh, helping somebody get comfortable with being a public speaker, that's one that people really struggle with also. And as a result of, of doing this and gaining that confidence and being able to come back two or three sessions later and say, hey, this is what you look like when we filmed you during session one, look at you now, session three, it's a, it's a, an incredible transformation in terms of who you are and what you're doing. And then people understand, wow, 
I was, you know, I didn't know at session one. Now by session three, I'm really intentional with the way I'm doing this. And, uh, and, and this does become great deliverable stuff for you to actually have that you can use on a website, in your marketing materials, in your elevator pitches, and, you know, in the social media posts that you put out um, for, for uh, quite some time to come. Oh my gosh. And, and I think the people will see when they go to your website to see the people, the companies you've worked with. I mean, you've worked with Universal and Disney and Walgreens and just Walmart, all these huge names. Um, so it's not like this is something that you're just doing on the back. You know, this, this, you've had a little bit, you have 30 years of experience in this area. So, you know, and I, I want to briefly touch on, um, one other thing because you have such an, so, so much background with this is, um, product development and merchandising. And I know this is a different direction than what we've been talking about with branding, but I think it's something that is a natural uh, transition here because so many people that I know that are working on personal brand are asking and looking into the idea of merch, having getting merchandise for their brand. And so what do you think about that? Is that something that everyone should do? How do we decide if that's for us? in our space if, with branding? Is that the next step or when do we do it? Do we wait till like we're really big and we have like, you know, 500,000 followers or 50,000 followers on social media or whatever? Or do we start now? Would, and what would it be? Is it just picking anything or what do you think? Well, I think this is a really strategic decision that uh, that people make also. And, and I will say doing this um, for all the years that I'm doing this, the, the last thing in the world that I ever want to do is have somebody buy 500 or 200 of anything that they don't have an immediate need for. It's a big mistake that, uh, that mm -hmm. I've seen people make, whether they're creating a product for retail or they're creating a promotion uh, for themselves. Again, why? Why am I doing this? Why is this something that I need? Why is this an investment that, that I have to have? And if I'm going to make that investment, what is the long-term value that my customers get out of that and that I get as a result uh, of doing it. Because now we get to this threshold of, is this something that you're giving away? So you create a, a Trojan horse kind of feeling where, uh, you know, if, if you know, we, you and I both love these pens, if I did one of these pens and now it's got my business name on it and now it's sitting on Jill Collins desk, I know every morning when she goes to do her, her journaling or her logging, she's seeing that and thinking, oh yeah, I got to get in touch with that guy. That's wonderful, uh, and 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 it's somewhat aligned to um, to what we do. But am I going to? I see people do things like I'm going to give out a lip balm, and I'm like, what in the world? You know, are you Estee Lauder or Clinique or Lancome or uh, you know, pick your favorite brand of cosmetic because that's what we're all using, all that popular stuff that's out there. And so now you're going to invest money in some formula that you don't even know to give out a lip balm because somebody who's in this business of promotional products has talked you into thinking, oh, this is the cool thing that people are doing right now. If you're not in that space, if you're not a cosmetic person, if what you're doing doesn't have something to do with somebody's um, um, facial image, right? Why would you be giving out a cosmetic? So um, creating merch has um, you know, has meaning behind it, but we want to make sure that that's a further extension of all the branding that you're doing and that it enhances your brand. And somewhere down the line, somebody having that in front of them reminds them that they haven't been in touch with you or they want to go to your website. Um, a while back, I, I did because I, again, a lot of what I do uh, is focused on communication. So I did um, wireless chargers, the kind that you could lay your mobile phone down on yeah. and it'll charge without plugging it in. And so th the surface of that has my logo, has always been creative on it. And I'd like to think that in a business setting, that's sitting someplace where every time someone goes and lays their phone on it, they're seeing my business name there. And maybe they're thinking of me or always been creative and they're coming back to me because the phone involves communication. So for me, that makes some sense as a self-promotion for myself, but I had to carefully consider who would be using that, why would they be using that, what's, how's that related to what I do? Um, so it's a great question, and promotional products and merch are great if, in fact, you've got a game plan to go with them so that the investment 
enhances your brand. Okay. So the investment should enhance your brand. And that's for tchotchkes and things like that that are giveaways. I'm thinking more what I'm seeing people doing now is they're selling merchandise. They're creating something with their logo and they're selling it. And I'm going, is that something people are like interested in? And I'm wondering if that's of value or, you know, there's, there's that. And that's one. And then the next one, if we have time is, is, um, people who are doing like, um, sponsorships, like, oh, I use this pen and I'm a pencil, but, you know, disclaimer, I'm paid for saying that, you know, or something like that. That's another piece. And that's really not merch as much as it is just, um, you know, affiliate or, or sponsorship. But so let's stick with the first one that I just mentioned is, is when people are selling, wanting to sell and create a store, a store, a marketplace. And they sell. Right. So for the right business, right, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about that is somebody who does say, uh, you know, is an inspirational coach. And, you know, there's a particular message that, that, that has become their go-to uh, slogan, their go-to saying, and it's meaningful for somebody to want to wear that around on a nicely designed t-shirt or a baseball cap. But for me, you have to have a, um, a fairly substantial following to, number one, think that people are going to want to pay for that. And number two, that they're actually going to want to wear it, make it part of their wardrobe, because just because it's a great saying, just because it seems inspirational doesn't mean that I necessarily want to be wearing it to the beach or wearing it out in public where I'm going. And we also have to make sure that if I'm doing this, do I wear white t-shirts? Do I wear black t-shirts? What size t-shirt do I wear? So we have to be careful about that because again, um, this becomes an inventory burden. And I, I can't tell you how many times in my life people have gone out, made purchases like this where a minimum is going to be uh, you know, 50 t-shirts and now they're sitting with 48 t-shirts because I gave one to know, their mom. <laughs> your mom didn't, you know, d- mom took one. She's using it to polish the furniture. Maybe you've got a sibling that's interested in, in using it. Um, but now they're sitting there. So I think we have to be careful and separate our ego out of whether or not this merchandise is really something I could use. Maybe somebody who's doing that, I would lead them more along the lines of a coffee mug that somebody would look at every day and see an inspirational um, message on rather than apparel that somebody might not be willing uh, to wear. But again, it, it really warrants a very long discussion to say, is this a good place for me to invest in my brand as opposed to other places that might be more meaningful and might literally give you more bang um, for your buck in terms of what uh, what you're doing? And and and. Again, sometimes these things can be serious investments. I know today there are um, certain companies that will print T-shirts on demand. And so you can start to try and do that. But again, you have to ask yourself, how many people want to be wearing your slogan um, and, you know, as part of their apparel? Um, yeah, you, you have to reach kind of a, a sort of a cult fan following where you have a in order critical, to really yeah, critical mass. Critical mass. Yeah, I and I I get that. I, I'm thinking about times where this going back to the free or the the giveaways is times when I've gotten I like, signed up for an event and then they send me a bunch of things and there's like a hat with a logo on it and I'm going like I'm not going to wear that, you know, or it has a name of something. I'm like, why would I no, you know? And so it's I either give it away or it sits in the back of my closet behind all the other hats that I'd actually wear, kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so and the only ones I can honestly think of that I really would wear are things like the Tony Robbins ones, you know, that we get or you know, things that have like a cool slogan, but you're right. It's like most of the things that we get are, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, no. <laughs> there, you know, sometimes there's real utility. If someone was getting no, like, an umbrella, right, you know, yeah. and it rained and it's like, well, it's not my favorite umbrella, but it's better than uh, better than nothing. Those are expensive, but it's sitting in, sitting in your closet kind of thing. So, and and here's the other side of that equation, Jill. So you got that hat. Somebody probably spent a minimum of $8.00 to make that hat, depending on whether or not it's embroidered, um, is a one size fits all, is it a Velcro back, right? You know, depending on what kind of hat, but let's just use $6 as an example. And they had to buy 500. Well, now there's $3,000 that somebody just spent in their marketing budget for hats that do they have 3000 they could get out immediately. Do they have a trade show coming up where they know they're going to be handing them out? But now even more to the fact, Jill took it, 
She smiled. Great. It's a, it's a great thing to hand out at a trade show. It's going right in the back of the closet. So now I've spent all this money for this impression and it hasn't done anything as opposed to, was there something else that was really more well-suited for your brand that would work better? So again, we have to separate you know, our egos out of this and think, gee, why wouldn't anybody want to wear one of my, there you go. <laughs> I'm yeah, telling her myself, I stole a there, pen. There you go. A good pen, a good writing pen. A good writing pen, is, you know, and that's why pens are, are one of the most popular um, promotional items, but it's not something you'd probably spend money for, right? Because you'd say, why am I going to buy your pen? I can get a million pens, you know, I can go to the, the bank and get a pen. I can go you know, anywhere and get a pen. I can go down and buy a big pen for a quarter at the stationery store. Right. So I'm probably not going to, you know, going to buy yours. So again, what's the compelling reason okay. behind exactly, you know, what, you know, what that is. So, um, you know, here's a great example, right? If, if I'm in, um, you know, speech pathology or something and, you know, one of my root causes, why I do this is people are listening to music you know, too loud. And so I'm going to give out a pair of, um, um, you know, um, Nearby? sound, sound deadening things, right? Oh, so noise that can't. if someone, noise can't, someone goes to a concert, they're not going to get, you know, deafened by going to oh, the sure. concert. And now it ties back into every time I put these on, oh yeah, doctor so-and-so gave these to me because she didn't want me to go deaf or because I'm already having issues with my hearing. Now it's something that's really enhancing my brand. And depending on the level of what the noise canceling stuff is, that might even be something you say, wow, these are even better than, you know, ear pods or, or Bose noise canceling things or, you know, whatever the case may be. So that's a case where it's enhancing the brand and it's enhancing my professionalism in terms of, of what I'm doing. And it makes sense. And every time someone goes to use that, it's further enhancing who I am to them as somebody who really gives a damn about whether or not they're going deaf. Oh, I love that so much. I think that is so cool. That is really be oh, that's a great example, by the way. Um, whoever somebody's a in, in audio an audiologist. Yeah, I really honestly, that, I just move. somewhere I don't know where that one came to me. I never thought of it before, <laughs> but but I'll go with it. <laughs> that's a great one. Um, yeah, that's that's a perfect example for tying in your brand with what you do. And it's a it's a, I care about you, so here. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, Glenn, I tell you, there, I think there's another show we could even do on some more topics. I had so many other questions, but I think we'll we'll leave it here today with um, talking about brand and going so deep here with this. And um, thank you for sharing um, to, with us today and everything you talked about and, and your um, your program that you're offering, the one on one with with people. And uh, I think everyone should take advantage of that when if you're in that space where you're just. I think one going back is like picking something and sticking with it. You know is. And, and really, in, in the tendency is that we do get a little bored with it or we think, oh, it's not working or we see a slight change in our, in our analytics or our numbers and we're going, oh, it happened. Did I do something wrong? And then we want to change and pivot all the time. So that was a great takeaway, great reminder for me. And then the other one is just pick something and stick with it, of course, and then write it out even when it doesn't look like it's doing anything, you know, or, it's, or things are fluctuating because that's normal and keep repeatedly being consistent and doing it regularly and consistently. And intentionality, 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 do what you're doing, because that's what you, you are supposed to be doing and keep doing it intentionally, because people will start to notice that if every time you show up in a social media post, if you go to this clubhouse app that, that, that you and I met on, if you're on LinkedIn live, you know, wherever it is, you're appearing every single time show up as the consistent real you that you want people to know you as your, your brand, your company's brand, your personal brand, bring those together. If you and the, and, and the company are one in the same, if you are the spokesperson for the brand, so that every time we think of the brand, we think of you, every time we think of you, we think of your brand. And, and I think it will make it a lot easier for you to manage your business intentions going forward. Gosh, that's so beautiful. Perfectly tied, tied up there. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone, if you have questions, Glenn, I'm sure will be available on YouTube to answer questions and you want more information, reach out to Glenn. He's going to have, we're going to have the links in there below and uh, tell me more of what you want to hear. Who do you want more of this kind of content? Let's let me know what you want. I'm, I'm here to serve. So 
I want to thank everyone for being here today. And uh, remember to stay connected. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Glenn. See you soon. Thank you.